Hey everyone, welcome back to Barter Hordes. My name is Robert. Happy Friday, happy November, um, happy nonfiction November. Uh, I'm kind of sad that Halloween's over. Um, I'm not a huge Halloween um, partier. Uh, we had zero people come by through the neighborhood last night for trick-or-treating. I don't know if it's because of the weather, but we had nobody last year either, so maybe we're just not in the greatest location. Um, but I, I'm sad because it means I'm not going to be using my Halloween spooky intro anymore next year. Um, it's been a little bit slower reading week for me. As I mentioned in a previous Friday Reads video, I've kind of gone away a little bit from the dark side of reading multiple books at once. And one of the downsides for me of doing that is I seem to end up reading less when I do that. I don't read as many pages per day if it's all in the same book. So I'm kind of compromising uh, now. I'm reading two books at a time instead of three, four, five, or six books at a time. So let me talk about the two that I finished. The first one was a very quick read um, for a really quirky reason. Uh, the last school I taught in, uh, we did a little lit literary prize there. And one of the judges for that prize this year apparently backed out at the last second. And so the woman who coordinates the prize now emailed me and asked me if I'd read either of the books. And I had read one, but I hadn't read the other. Um, but I had a copy of it and it wasn't too long. So very quickly, I read Peter Heller's The River as part of that competition. Um, and I enjoyed it. It's, it's a very interesting, adventurous mysterious, suspenseful story. It's about two college friends, Jack and Wynn, who are at um, Dartmouth, and they have decided to take the summer and the fall semester off and do a canoeing adventure um, through a series of lakes and rivers. And both of them are very experienced outdoorsmen. They both taught wilderness courses. They have both taken wilderness courses, so they're very experienced in what they're planning to do. And they were planning to take their time going, uh, on the map it looks like they're going up the river because they're going north, but the river is actually flowing down that way. So, and they're headed towards the Hudson Bay. And very early on in the book, they figure out that there is a forest fire in the region. They smell it one evening when they stopped and they climb a tree and they can see evidence of it from about 20 miles away. And of course, it's coming their direction, which gives them a sense of impending urgency. They don't have an easy way of contacting the person who is supposed to pick them up with a, a um, amphibious airplane. They were basically dropped off on a lake and they were planning to call from the end of their journey and be picked up, but they don't have a satellite phone to reach this person and get picked up in the middle. So they're not really sure what they should do. And shortly thereafter, they see two other parties on the same path, basically. The first one is a, a pair of drunken Texas louts and so they don't spend much time there, but it gives an ominous feel to the book. And then shortly after that, they hear a couple, man and wife, um, arguing, or they assume it's a man and wife, it turns out it actually is, uh, arguing near the banks, but they don't actually see them. And they want to warn them that the fire's coming and ask if they need any help, uh, but they can't find them. They actually go back to try to find them again and there's no trace of them. So that's kind of ominous. And from there, it just it, it's their adventure facing this fire, dealing with these other two groups of people who come into the story again and again. And I really enjoyed the suspenseful part of it. This is the first Peter Heller that I've ever read. He's well known for The Dog Eaters and some other books, but I've never read him before. Um, he has kind of a spare writing style sometimes. And at times I can see why some people disliked this book because it gets into the weeds literally on the details of their, their canoeing technique, their equipment, there are pages 
sometimes that are just lists of equipment and things that they might need. And that can get a little bit tedious if you're there just for the adventure story, which I kind of was. Uh, but overall, I liked it okay. I, I think I gave it four stars. It was kind of a three and a half, four star read for me. Uh, enough that I would probably pick up another Peter Heller sometime, but I'm not racing to the bookstore to buy his entire back catalog. The other book that I just finished this week is a brand new release by Ann Patchett. Everybody's heard of it, The Dutch House. Ann Patchett is a booktube and independent bookseller's uh, favorite, has been for years. I found Ann Patchett with Bel Canto years ago. And while I think Bel Canto is probably still my favorite of her novels, I haven't read all of them. I think I have two or three others that I still have to read. Bel Canto is probably my favorite of the ones that I've read, but The Dutch House is a pretty close runner-up. Uh, like many of her books, it is a domestic story of sorts. It's not about the Dutch House School of Architecture, as some people guessed when they saw the title. It is about a house, literally, a house in the uh, suburbs, or actually not the suburbs, but the outskirts of Philadelphia that this family buys when the Dutch family who built it on the back of a cigarette empire, when they all died, there was no one left to inherit it, um, this family bought it for a song. And it's, it's almost like a museum. It's very uh, cold and foreboding at some times, but it's also uh, well lit, lots of windows and kind of attractive. The story is really about two siblings, Maeve, and her younger brother Danny, who is the narrator of the book. They are the children of the man, uh, I think his name is Cyril, who bought the house originally. And you learn right at the beginning that they've lost their mother. She's not dead, she has left them, she's abandoned them, and they don't really know why. Um, there's some speculation, but they're not ever 100% sure. She's gone off to India, apparently. The father makes it sound like She's crazy, think of her as dead, but the kids aren't convinced. Anyway, this is the story of the brother and sister throughout the years. Uh, you learn very quickly, and you learn this from the dust jacket too, so this isn't a tremendous spoiler, but when their father dies, their stepmother throws them out of the house. They become homeless and poor overnight after growing up in fairly uh, well-established luxury. And so it's their stories of how they recreate their lives, how they stay in the lives of other people around them, family members, friends, people that used to work with, with their house, so on. So it's a domestic story, but it covers a long period of time. Uh, I, I really did enjoy it. Uh, it's, a, it's a lot like Commonwealth in the sense that it's the story of a family uh, that disintegrates and reforms and things like that. Uh, but I think this one's even better than Commonwealth. At least it was for me. So that's Ann Patchett's latest one, The Dutch House. And if you don't know Ann Patchett, she is the co-owner of a fabulous independent bookstore in Nashville called Parnassus Books, um, which is one of my favorite bookstores to visit when I'm in that area. Um, the three that I'm currently reading, one I'm not really reading right now, I kind of put it on hold a little bit, that's The Little History of Literature by John Sutherland. I've been, I was reading a chapter a day, very short chapters, uh, and then I got kind of sidetracked and, and lost momentum with that one, so I'm getting back into that one a little bit. But the two actual books that I'm reading, the first of which was an unofficial selection for my nonfiction November pile of possibilities, and that is Samantha Power's memoir about her life in public service as part of the Obama administration, as the U.S.'s ambassador to the United Nations, and that is The Education of an Idealist. I'm probably 75 or 80 percent finished with that. I should be able to finish it this weekend, so it'll be my first official finish for Nonfiction November, although I started it in October. It's a fascinating story. She's had a, an amazing career in terms of all the things that she's been involved in. I don't love the writing. It's, even though she started off as a journalist, she writes like a bureaucrat. And at times, 
I just ache for a straightforward sentence that's not loaded with buzzwords and things like that. Um, but the story itself is fascinating. I think of what I've read so far, I'm most fascinated by her three and a half or four years as the UN ambassador. Some of the things that she was involved in there and some of the things that she instituted as the ambassador to the UN, I thought were remarkable and I, I really enjoyed that section. But the whole thing has been interesting to read and I'm looking forward to what's going on in the last part that I haven't read yet. The other one that I just started a day or two ago is a backlist title by Kate Atkinson, A God in Ruins. This is one that Sarah from Hardcover Hearts recommended to me. Uh, I liked Life After Life, but I don't remember much of it. And apparently this is linked in some way to that book, but it's clear that you don't have to have read the first one or to read Life After Life in order to read this one because I'm reading it without any memory of Life After Life and it's fine. It's a little confusing in the sense that it jumps around chronologically among the different members of the family that are involved, but she does such a good job of building each character somewhat individually that it's not been, it's not been too jarring. I'm just not sure exactly what she's doing it for yet. I'm not far enough into the book. Now I'm doing this one joint text and audio, which I haven't done for a month or two. And the audio version is wonderful. Uh, I forget the man's name who, who reads the book. Uh, he has a wonderful voice and does a very good job with the different characters' voices and so on. But his pace is a little bit slow, and so it's taking me a lot longer to read this book than if I did it just in text. I did try speeding it up. I'm not a big fan of speeding it up, and this one is, is kind of why. The minute I sped it up even to one and a quarter time speed, it just sounds artificial and um, unnatural to me. And I just couldn't listen to it at that pace, even though I could easily understand the words at that pace. It just, the experience itself was ruined for me. So I put it back on regular one time and uh, I'm just going through it slowly. So I can't read that one as fast as I normally read, but I'm enjoying it um, a lot better than transcription, which I did not really care for last year. This one is a different style book and it's probably more like the style I enjoyed in Life After Life. So that's what I'm reading. Uh, I've got one nonfiction on the go, one kind of reference book that I'm going through very slowly, and one backlist novel. As soon as I finish the backlist novel, I'll be back into reading 2019 new releases again because I still have a, a slew of them to choose from. Uh, I hope you've had a great week. I hope you had a nice Halloween. I know on the East Coast, a lot of us had rain and that kind of ruined it for the kids, but uh, I hope everybody was safe and had a good time. And I look forward to talking to you again early next week. Bye, everybody.